This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate the introduction. I also appreciate the invitation from Dr. Rebecca Nelson um, for the opportunity. I uh, hate, hate that it's virtually, but, uh, but nevertheless, excited to, uh, to be a part of the, the Plant Breeding and Genetics Seminar Series. Um, Steve kind of highlighted, so my work is, is clearly on the applied side, but we also do some you know, theoretical research and, and, and look at ways to improve genetic gain in cereal crops. And so you, you saw that uh, primarily my focus on uh, winter wheat and sorghum, and you're wondering those crops generally don't pair well together. Why, why would I work on two of the most divergent cereals in the grass family? And, uh, you know, from the, from the macro level, uh, when you look at winter wheat, it's an allohexaploid from three different wild progenitors and, and a large genome size of 16 gigabase. And then you've got an estimated over 100,000 genes to pick apart. And then on sorghum, uh, which is a close a cereal crop uh, close relative to maize. It's a diploid crop with a relatively small genome at 730 megabases and only 34,000 genes. But, um, you know, there's obviously those contrasts, but, but when you look uh, more closely, um, you look at weed, it behaves primarily like a diploid because there's limited uh, crossover recombination events uh, across the different progenitor genomes. You look at the genetic resources. So, so recently there was a, a quality reference genome in wheat developed and there's, um, there's been a, a reference genome that Steve's been a part of that, that was done over a decade ago now. And so there's, there's quality genetic resources available. There's plenty of a uh, plethora of mapping populations and, and genetic diversity to exploit for genetic gain. And, uh, and there's also similar focal traits of interest, especially when you look at the traits that we'd like to focus on in terms of yield components for productivity, grain quality, and also disease resistance, which is obviously very important um, for our region. There's also similar in uses um, in terms of both food products and for the animal feed industry. Um, and, and from the standpoint of there's a lot of opportunity in the public se sector to make improvement for these crops because of relatively speaking, limited private industry involvement in, the, in research and development. Before I get into, uh, I've got multiple projects that I really wanna highlight um, that, that are more pre-breeding germplasm enhancement genetic studies that, that, are, um, that were initiated to supplement the breeding program. I wanted to highlight the breeding program uh, of what we do and why we do it. Um, so we have, uh, you know, of course, a, a, a fully fledged uh, wheat cultivar development pro program, as well as a hybrid sorghum program here at Clemson. And, uh, you know, within wheat, um, which we work with pure line cultivars, we don't right now work with hybrid wheat. Um, there, there's really two pipelines, the standard pipeline, which uh, looks familiar to a lot of breeders and geneticists, which we look at early generation mass selection. And then at the F5 stage, uh, the F4 lines, F4, 5 lines are genotyped uh, for preliminary genomic selection um, to, to generate estimated breeding values, as well as getting marker information on major effect genes that would include photo period, vernalization, um, disease resistance, hessian fly resistance, and plant height, among others. Um, those that make it to the next generation, we start yield testing, and then it scales up as most programs do for multi-environment, multi-replication testing. The DH or doubled haploid pipeline, um, it's just different in the sense that, you know, uh, doubled haploid is a familiar concept across um, several crops, but, um, but for weed, it's, it's a well-established uh, pipeline to where you utilize, you make an F1 cross in the greenhouse, you plant that F1 
plant back in the greenhouse and you cross fertilize with maize pollen and it, uh, the, the maize chromosomes don't materialize and you, you, you end up with haploid, um, haploid immature seeds that you can res do embryo rescue, generate doubled haploids from that process. And then we can obviously go directly into yield testing because that is a fully inbred homozygous line. On the whole, uh, excuse me, hybrid sorghum side, we also have parallel pipeline because we have to work across fertility pools to where we're developing female parents and male parents in tandem. And uh, the early generation selection process is different. We use a pedigree method of selection in the, in the F2 through F4 stage. And then in the F5 stage, because it's a hybrid crop, we begin test crossing with um, multiple elite testers across both male and female uh, lines in development. We evaluate those test cross um, hybrids and, and generally two environments and, and one or two replications um, just because of seed limitations at the early testing stage. And then if female lines, and we use a male gameticide, by the way, to to be able to allow us to produce hybrid seed at the F5 stage for females because they are um, male fertile. Uh, but then if they have a high general combining ability, then we look at moving forward with sterilizing that line in development to create an A1 or, or female cytoplasmic male steril, sterile line counterpart or AB line to, um, to release to the commercial companies for specific combining ability testing and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. We also use all season or counter nurseries across both crops to celebrate uh, the cultivar crop improvement process. Um, for winter wheat, our general counter nursery in the summer nursery is Aberdeen, Idaho. We grow winter wheat here in South Carolina. And uh, we utilize that to advance F1 crosses to, ge to generate F2 bulk seed to plant um, that the F1s are grown in the summer and we get the seed back in time for fall planting in November. And then we also can increase double haploids to go straight to yield testing. On the other side, sorghum, um, of course, being a, a warm season grass, we have a tropical winter nursery uh, located generally it's in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. We, we've also used Puerto Rico as well, but uh, we utilize it also for advancing F1s and we also use it to develop our test cross hybrids because our environment here in South Carolina with the humidity and disease problems that we have is not really a minimal to hybrid seed production. Uh, this slide is probably a shocker to everyone that South Carolina is not Kansas, um, which Kansas is a state that typically leads acreage for both crops. You look at uh, how much wheat is grown in Kansas and sorghum, 2.7 million hectares for wheat, 1.3 million hectares in general for sorghum. Uh, South Carolina, not quite that amount, right? So um, there's actually only about 2 million hectares of farmland to total in South Carolina. So it's, it's a different, uh, excuse me, a different, um, you know, uh, demographic there in terms of agriculture and, and there's different priorities, of course, that, that come with that. But, the, but agriculture is certainly important here in our state and in our region. And when you look at just uh, the amount of mouse to feed uh, here on the East Coast, and a demand for more local and sustainable uh, food, you can see that uh, we do have water, we do have uh, uh, a food market, and uh, that creates a clear opportunity. We just don't have the farm area and soils um, that say the Midwest or Great Plains has. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the importance of feed, um, this uh, county-based map shows where grain is a surplus in blue and where grain is a deficit in red. And 
you can clearly see that most of the southeastern states or eastern states in general are, are really grain deficit. And, and that's due to a lot of anim, uh, poultry and, and swine production in this region. And so um, from an animal feed standpoint, um, there's a, a lot of demand for uh, regional grain production. And so within that framework and context, um, I, I set out on a journey to develop a cereal grain breeding and genetics program here at Clemson and, and thought a lot about how to structure that. And, and really, and Steve alluded to, to, to working with industry, is, is really I wanted to let industry kind of dictate the major challenges and opportunities that we as a, as a public program need to focus on. And then in turn, we can develop research aims to um, and individualized schemes to make genetics improvements within the traits that, that we, we want to improve. And then also, in general, increase the productivity across our target population of environments. And, you know, from that, as you probably saw within the abstract, there's just, in, in my mind, there's no current one size fits all approach to crop improvement. You know, we've got to take unique uh, strategies and concepts to uh, to tackle whatever problems that we face. And so with, within that as well, um, the program is really striving to identify useful genetics to plug into um, our genetic base and, and, and improve or boost our genetic diversity within the program to, to capitalize on. And then also we want to look at developing new selection schemes and strategies to improve the rate of genetic gain. And that's just what this schematic depicts. And so getting into the talk, it's going to be three different pr parallel projects that, that somewhat complement each other, but they're all centered around productivity, quality and value and how we improve those three. The first, is a dedicated screening of fusarium resistance in cereals. And I put cereals there because we work across both wheat and sorghum for incorporating resistance to this fungal pathogen. The second is identifying grain secondary metabolites that um, have antimicrobial activity. This was a recent uh, work uh, done by a Clemson graduate student, Lindsay Shields. And then third is a OREI, a NIFA OREI project um, that is centered around low input organic management practices uh, to look at, you know, what is the ideal sorghum idiotype or what are the focal traits that we should be working on to improve productivity as well as quality and value. <clears throat> so going back to screening of fusarium resistance in both wheat and sorghum. Uh, disease resistance, as I mentioned, is, is, a, is a very important you know, uh, focal interest of our program because of necessity. Um, we live in a very high humidity environment, especially in the summertime, as if any of you have, have ventured down to the southeastern US in, in July or August. Um, you can relate and, and not that um, New York is, is that much less humid, but um, disease resistance clearly on the East Coast is important from, uh, from the standpoint of it's a, it's a great conducive environment for fungal pathogen growth. And, uh, and within Fusarium specifically, the dominant species within weed is Fusarium graminearum. It, it generates the dominant toxin deoxynovalanol or DON. And th the threshold of DON in foods is one part per million or in swine, uh, in feeding swine is five ppm. Uh, in sorghum, the dominant species, even though it varies a lot as well as wheat, it is verticillioides. And the dominant toxin is fumonisin, uh, fumonisin B1. And the food threshold is still very low at four parts per million. And so 
from a farmer's pers perspective, these traits for breeding resistance is obviously critical, right? Because they either have two options if they have an infestation of these, these mycotoxins, they can sell it at a very reduced price or a more likely scenario is they turn around and go back to their farms and dump it on their land somewhere. So how do we screen for fusarium resistance in wheat? So uh, Steve mentioned in the inter introduction that I'm a part of the US Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative. Within that initiative that was established about 15 years ago, there's a coordinated project for variety development and host resistance. And we collaborators within that project all have a mist irrigated and inoculated wheat scab nursery that we evaluate every year. Uh, a lot of different varieties and, and improved lines that are in the cultivar development pipeline. And how we do that is we isolate Fusarium graminearum spores from the previous year's crop from infested heads. We culture those isolates um, in a among, among bean broth and then take that broth and then put that into autoclave maize kernels to where we develop, develop this scabby maize inoculum as you see in that picture in the middle in the bottom. And so you can see the mycelial development there. After two or three weeks of, of culturing in that scabby maize, we can take, we can break that up and we actually, de we deploy the individual maize kernels and scatter them out by hand to create as even as, as a disease pressure of Fusarium graminearum as we can get across the fields for uh, a relative field screening rating and, and, and a good measure of disease resistance for this fungal pathogen. We're also developing um, measures to more objectively evaluate important traits associated with Fusarium head blight or scab, which is it's typically called. Um, and one of the traits that we focus on is called FDK, which stands for Fusarium Damaged Kernels, which Fusarium comes in and infects that flowering. And then it, and then it progresses into the seed and early development and pre prevents normal grain field duration. So, uh, or normal grain filling. And so you end up with shriveled seeds that are typically blighted or bleached in color. And so you can utilize both color and seed size dimensions to develop a proprietary algorithm. And this was done by the company Vibe in Imaging Analytics that, that sent us a Vibe Green Analyzer to do this. And how does this work very quickly? You can see that there is a, a mixture of different colored grains of, of wheat kernels here. You have normal wheat color uh, or, or wheat kernels that are have that typical soft red wheat uh, characteristics. Um, and then you have the blighted seed, uh, which are bleached and, and lighter in color. And they also tend to be, um, we call them tombstones because they're a lot narrower because of the lack of grain fill. And so this is a picture by the vibe in, in the user interface. And this is after analysis you look at it, it individually analyzes each kernel and it d determines based on that calibration of color and size dimensions, which seeds are classified as FDK or Fusarium damaged kernels. And then it gives an overall percentage within that sample. If you look in the bottom right here, it's an overall percentage of 34% of this sample. And so this is a very, important um, objective measure for screening FHB resistance that we're deploying. And it's very accurate. I won't go into the details of this, this slide because I want to focus more downstream uh, of why we're utilizing this objectively. But, um, but you can see if you just look at samples that were, that were harvested and, and sent from Winsboro, Louisiana, that this new vibe instrument is uh, has, has shown to be much more effective 
uh, when compared to NR spectroscopy, um, the visual ratings, which we sometimes still use, manual ratings, which are a pain because you have to literally count out kernels um, and it's still subjective. And then the gold standards is actually measuring the content of the, uh, the, the levels of deoxynovalin or Don within the grain. And so we, we were comparing how, how well the vibe compared or correlated with with the oxygen all, and it turns out it was is very highly correlated more than the other methods. <clears throat> so, so we take that severity or FDK measure, and, and we're actually incorporating that into um, developing training populations for wheat um, to screen for FHB resistance, and that's what this slide shows on how accurate we're getting in genomic prediction for this trait. And it turns out you look at a correlation or prediction accuracy of, of almost 0.7. It turns out that for, um, for several reasons that you can, you can predict based on genomics, uh, fusarium resistant lines or susceptible lines very well. And if you look at the different, uh, the different symbols and colors in this graph, what it's getting at is you look at the top 25% of lines and the top 25% being the most resistance to FHB are, are outlined in red. And then the bottom 75% are highlighted in blue. And then this, the different shape of the symbol denotes whether it was in the top 25% for FDK or FDK and Don or just Don or it wasn't predicted in the top quarter by either of those traits or in combination. And so you can see that there's this cluster of lines here that have this, that do not have this, the cross or, or, or plus signs that denote that most of these that we would select based on observations, which is the Y axis, were also predicted in the top 25%, which is in that lower right quadrant. If you look at FDK alone, which is the same trait as severity, you, you can see in circles here, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of the eight um, were predicted in that bottom left quadrant, which is what you would ideally select on. So we're implementing genomic prediction for this trait and it's working very well. And just in context, so every year within the Sun Grains program that, that Clemson is a part of, um, we, we evaluate between three to 4,000 wheat lines that get um, genotyping by sequencing data each year. We're also utilizing genomic prediction to, uh, to try to predict population variants and, and tell us which crosses we should make or what parents we should use and, and what combinations we, sh we should um, make from those parents. And this was a, um, a result of a program called POPBAR, which is an R package program developed by Mohsen Mohammadi at the university or Purdue University. And what it, what it generates is based on a combination and the genetics or genomics sequence of each parent it generates estimated breeding values of all of the cross progenies from that cross. So all of the progeny from the cross. So it generates different parameters, including the mean, but, but more importantly, the population variance. We want the population variance to be, be large to enable more, more selection. And then also we want uh, the we want transgressive segregants to be able to select lines that are more resistant than both of their parents combined and taking advantage of additive genetic variation. And so it generates, the program generates the mean lowest 10%. And, and again, this is for FHB resistance. So we want the lowest 10% um, uh, in this. If it for yield, it would be the highest 10%. And so we utilize that program and it's working very well. Um, we're also cross-cutting research into sorghum. And uh, this is a project that my graduate student, AJ Ackerman is working on. And it's looking at different types of 
of resistance to Fusarium verticillioides. But um, I, I'm just going to fly through these a little bit so I can get through them. But um, but they published a, a review AJ did along with um, with Anthony Went, uh, who was at Cornell and, and part of the Nelson lab, um, and looked at potential pathways that are important for disease mechanisms, disease resistance mechanisms in sorghum, and specifically for fusarium grain mold resistance. And AJ looked, he took a very resistant genotype and a very susceptible genotype and generated untargeted metabolomics on that. And uh, this is what the volcano plot is showing. Each dot represents a mass feature of metabolite. And those that are on the left side have a much higher relative abundance uh, compared to the, the abundance of the susceptible uh, genotype and vice versa on the right side in red. Uh, what I just wanted to quickly point out is um, he, he quickly found that those that had the highest confidence uh, those metabolites or mass features with the highest confidence and then the greatest fold change, they tended to show up in the flavonoid pathway, uh, putatively speaking. And this just shows uh, a kind of a contorted PCA to visualize discriminating um, uh, variants or metabolites in this example to, to also show that there were um, several metabolites that were within this flavonoid pathway that specifically were part of um, xenobiosis um, putative function. And so um, wrapping up part one, um, we, we looked at incorporating that objective FHB phenotyping platform and its help genomic prediction efforts. Um, that's, being, that's been uh, implemented well for this trait. Uh, we've looked at um, uh, through untargeted metabolomics, we found an enrichment of sorghum grain flavonoids uh, after a fusarium inoculation. And, uh, and more on, on the, the last bullet there is like using untargeted metabolomic data from variable genotypes, it kind of offers a, a relatively unique approach to infer mechanisms of resistance. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in this second part. Um, so this was a project again done by uh, former graduate student Lindsay Shields. This was published recently in Crop Science and it was looking at um, antimicrobial activity in, in sorghum and trying to predict or, or identify the genetic components of that. Um, why do we want to look at antimicrobial activity in sorghum? Well, one, there's a, been a big push in the poultry industry for um, uh, antibiotic-free poultry production, but there's still plenty of foodborne pathogens to deal with. And so if you can incorporate a natural antibiotic component or antimicrobial activity component in the grain, which sorghum is a major feed component, it's a win-win. And, uh, and also I mentioned that South Carolina is a major, uh, is a grain deficit state and importer of feed grain. So so we wanted to look at antimicrobial activity and, and we looked at a lot of different accessions from the sorghum association panel grown in the field. We took that grain, we ground it down and we extracted uh, secondary metabolites from that ground grain. And then we looked at a kind of a crude method of um, measuring antimicrobial activity. I'll talk about that in the next slide. And then based on that quantitative measure we looked at genome-wide association mapping. Uh, this is called a disk diffusion assay, and this was done in Dr. Xu Ping Zhang's lab here at Clemson, a microbiologist. We looked at two different pathogens, pathogens Salmonella enterica and Clostridium perfringens, and you can see that on the petri dish is a lawn of bacteria, and we we placed a sterile cotton disc that was saturated with the uh, with the sorghum extract of all these different genotypes, and we measured uh, the receding growth from that cotton disc. And how we measured it, we looked at the diameter across the circle there. This was a tetracycline antibiotic control, and you look here is a sorghum line uh, uh, extract from a sorghum line that had a 9.4 millimeter inhibition. So we did see considerable antimicrobial activity. What, 
we were scared of was that all this activity was dependent on con condensed tannins and polyphenols that are typically anti-nutritional from a feed standpoint. But when we looked at that relationship, we measured condensed tannins and total polyphenols. And we, we found that within clostridium perfringens, that necessarily wasn't the case. So it does seem that there is a, um, a, a unique mechanism that's causing this underlying antimicrobial potential. But however, what we did find with salmonella or find with salmonella enterica that there was a strong relationship between phenol content and antimicrobial activity for this pathogen. So we focus more on clostridium perfringens and you can see these dots here represent a genotype. And so these dots represent lines that have a, demonstrated a, lo a lot of antimicrobial activity, but had no condensed tannins and very low total polyphenols. This slide shows the same and just points out several sorghum accessions that are worth exploring for trade in progression. Here's a Manhattan plot that that plots out the GWAS results from the quantitative measure of antimicrobial activity, comparing that to the genome-wide um, GBS data for all these 384 sorghum lines. And, uh, and out of the top 100 SNPs that were associated across Clostridium and Salmonella, there was only one shared genetic marker, and that was located on chromosome 8, uh, S8351053. And the gene annotation was a serine threonine pho uh, protein phosphatase family. Um, the favorable allele at this, at this SNP um, was the C allele. And uh, the, you can see it conferred, it tend to confer a high amount or high level of antimicrobial activity for clostridium in particular. And you can see that, that irregular relationship or pattern with condensed tannins and phenols. So we found certain lines that had very little tannins or no tannins and phenols um, with high antimicrobial activity that contain this uh, disfavorable allele. From a broader perspective, when we looked across all the 384 lines, you can see that this, the effect of this, um, this one allele, um, the favorable allele had a uh, lines had an average uh, zone of inhibition uh, for uh, of 2.17 and then for the unfavorable allele down to 0.72. So it was a relatively large effect for this trait. We also looked at, again at untargeted metabolomics, circling back to that for, for looking at metabolites that are present in mature sorghum grain and to see uh, you know, what does their relative abundance, how does it correlate with different levels of antimicrobial activity? And we found that uh, there was, there were metabolites that had strong uh, trade-offs or, or correlations with the different relative abundance of individual mass features or metabolites. And so that provides kind of a a finer phenotyping measure, if you will, to, to utilize the, the mass feature metabolite that is highly correlated with your antimicrobial trait to look at relative abundance, compare that phenotype to uh, genomics information and, and uh, run a GWAS on that to, um, to, to do a finer point GWAS phenotyping strategy to increase or try to increase the reliability of, of identifying stronger associations. What you've got to be careful of is, is making sure that that mass feature is, a, is not in fact a confounding trait effect, um, but it is um, associated with your trait and, and microbial activity in this case uh, of interest. So the major takeaways from part two is that uh, there was a lot of antimicrobial activity found in sorghum. It was heritable and there were, I didn't show this, but there were no productivity trade-offs and there were no trade-offs with major uh, macronutrient compositional traits. And so that was positive. And, and even more positive was that there was no significant correlation between phenols and, and antimicrobial activity for clostridium perfringens. And we identified a genetic marker that we hope to explore in more detail and, and look at maybe developing uh, 
uh, cast markers for it to implement this trait or introgress this trait into our elite green material. Uh, the, the third part, and I'll be quick on this because we are running up on, on time here and I want to leave a, a little bit of time for questions, is uh, this was a project funded by the NIFA OREI program looking at sorghum for low input organic agricultural production. Sor sorghum is a sustainable crop. It's a non-GMO crop, so it makes sense from a, from a standpoint of marketing potential and production potential, but there has been very little work on that. And so first we had to ask the questions like, what is the, the ideal characteristics of sorghum to be productive under organic management? Um, what are the uh, traits of interest that, that we need to focus on? And then within the available sorghum germplasm that we have, how competitive are they with, with maize hybrids that were specifically developed for organic production? And uh, this is the, the breakdown of, of entries into this organic trial that en encompass a couple locations. It was 70 hybrids, 72 advanced breeding lines, 43 diverse inbred lines for the Sorghum Association panel, as well as a, a few sweet sorghum lines and then the four commercial maize checks. <clears throat> when we look within sorghum specifically, what we see is um, with respect to grain yield, um, sugarcane aphid tolerance, of course, had a strong relationship. Um, you needed sugarcane aphid tolerance to an appreciable level to have high yields within organic production, just because you're limited with chemical inputs. Another important aspect, and this is seen in wheat and other crops, is increased canopy closure. Canopy closure early on in the season was really highly correlated, positively correlated with, with terminal yield. And so this is a trait that we really need to focus on moving forward. Here's just a couple of nice slides that, that show the level of sugarcane aphid pressure in the field. And, and these plots um, in both pictures are uh, of the tolerant and susceptible line. They were grown right next to each other. The line just separates the two plots. But you can tell that if we take this figure on the left, there's healthy green sorghum plants that are heading out uh, at flowering. And on the right, you can see very little uh, sorghum panicles being um, are, are visible and a lot of chlorotic uh, vegetative tissue due to all the aphid feeding. So definitely a critical trait. Fortunately, we have a, a major effect gene or, or, or locus um, in RMES1. And when we looked at lines that had the lowest sugarcane aphid ratings or pressure in the field, all but one of these lines contain the RMES1 locus. So we know it's effective. Another important thing to note is in terms of yield productivity, the top three lines possess the RMES1 locus. <clears throat> so it was a very important uh, marker that we, that we currently screen for that we're gonna be make, making sure we screen more in depth in the future. Fusarium resistance was also important, and I, I've harped on that, you know, in, on, in the conventional efforts of wheat and sorghum, but, but it also had a major effect on yield and productivity in the organic study. And this was perceived to be due to, to decreased thresh, threshability due to the grain mold infecting and preventing uh, the, the grain to separate from the, um, from the chaff, from the glooms. One important aspect of the study is, as I mentioned, that we, we had a bunch of advanced breeding lines, a lot of genetic diversity, and we had a lot of hybrids in there as well. We wanted to look at the importance of heterosis in organic sorghum production because developing certified organic hybrid seed is a major hurdle to this industry. So if we didn't need heterosis, if we can exploit uh, pure line cultivar development for sorghum, maybe we can alleviate that challenge. But we found that heterosis was in fact important, especially under optimal environments. Uh, the high yielding environment at Clemson, you see a, a much more significant from a percentage heterosis basis than our low input marginal soils environment at, at WP Raw, which is in the, the sandier part of our state. In fact, in 2020 at that location, uh, the difference between hybrids and inbreds was insignificant, even though there was still a little bit of yield bump overall um, for hybrids. 
another thing to quickly point out here is that you did have some high yielding inbred cultivars or, or advanced breeding lines that yield very competitively among other top hybrid sorghums in the trial. The, the last point on this is um, we looked at, again, within environments, and I mentioned the low yielding environment, which is WP raw, and then the high yielding environment is Clemson. With respect to comparing against the four commercial maize checks, you can see that that maize really out yielded sorghum in the, the higher yielding environment, which is not a huge surprise there. Um, but when you looked at the interactive effect, the G by E effect, you can see that these sorghums, these top 10 sorghums in, in the trial overall, they tend to outperform maize in, in the low input marginal environment. <clears throat> and so there's plenty of opportunity here um, to improve sorghum organically, of course, but it does seem like there are opportunities now to develop commercially available sorghum lines and hybrids for this industry. <clears throat> I won't go through those takeaways um, because I, again, I wanna leave a few times for questions. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory. Again, just kind of going back to how our program wants to structure itself. We wanna identify and then incorporate useful genetics to uh, accelerate genetic gain, but we also wanna develop those new selection schemes to um, accelerate or change the slope, so to, so to speak, um, and, and accelerate genetic gain on a year over year basis. Um, and so uh, we'll be looking at always looking at projects within that within that scope of work. And so with that, I'll end and, and hopefully left time for, for several questions. Um, I know I had to blow through it a, a little bit quickly, more quickly than I'd like to, but uh, but I appreciate everyone being, uh, being here on the talk and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Rick. So there are a couple questions in the chat box. Do you want to just look at the chat box and address them? Sure, Steve. Um, the, the first was from Ace Repka. Do you know if the vibe is a hyperspect for what range of wavelengths they're looking at. So um, yeah, so I don't know, it's, it's all proprietary um, from the company we work with. Uh, it, all I can say is that it, uh, it seems to be looking at more hyperspectral, more different wavelengths to capture more subtle variation in, in color context. Um, but uh, I think there's plenty of opportunity to improve calibrations there as well. Um, and, and we'll be looking at that um, Vibe QM3 grain analyzer to, to look at quality components and, and different aspects across both wheat and sorghum too. And the next question um, from Dr. Ed Buckler is, uh, we see consistent cis effects in RNA expression. And did you profile metabolites at multiple tissue and time points? How correlated were these profiles across these? Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, we didn't have the opportunity to look at a, uh, a time point series or time series um, um, metabolite uh, vari variability and abundance. Obviously, that's our next step. We want to do targeted metabolites, or I'm sorry, targeted metabolomics within a smaller subset of germplasm to look at how a relative abundance changes across the, the, the period of infection, both pre-inoculated pre during the inoculation and then several time points after inoculation. Um, so that's our next step for sure. And then um, the last question in the chat was um, from uh, Dr. Rebecca Nelson, did the antimicrobials that were effective against bacteria also inhibit fungi? Um, really good question. Uh, we didn't necessarily look at that, Rebecca. Um, we, we should have, but um, I, I would expect uh, there to be some crossover, especially when you look at salmonella and the microbial activity, because the polyphenolic pathway was highly, or, or polyphenol content and tannins within the grain was highly correlated with that. Um, I'm still holding out hope that this uh, this defense mechanism or, or antimicrobial mechanism with 
respect to clostridium perfringens, that that is somewhat novel of a mechanism and, and not necessarily constrained to the traditional polyphenolic pathway. Um, but uh, we, we've got to, to do a lot more work on that. Uh, follow up question from Rebecca is where that all the antimicrobials only present after inoculation or were some constitutively express. Um, we, we only looked at uh, metabolite abundance in mature grain that was not uh, uh, that was not exposed to these foodborne pathogens. And so we wanted what our intention was is we wanted to look at what the natural abundance of these metabolites are in general, um, how, how present are they in mature grain. Um, and then because that's what you're going to be feeding, uh, poultry is the mature grain. We wanted to see what the concentration or abundance of the metabolites were within that, and then try to tease that or, or pair that together with the um, structured antimicrobial, more crude antimicrobial disdiffusion assays to, to look at um, extremes within the diverse sorghum germplasm. Okay, any more questions or last minute comments? Okay, Rick, I want to thank you for your seminar and really appreciate the effort you're putting in there at the PD Rec. Plenty to do. So thanks very much to everybody for showing up for the seminar. Oh, can you say a bit more about the organic market for sorghum? Rick, who's buying? Oh, Carolina Seed System Seed. Yeah, it's a big question. Um, certainly, Rebecca, and I had a good talk with uh, Dr. Sorrells this morning about uh, you know, the next phase of the ORI, ORI project is um, getting the stakeholders in the same room and figuring out, um, you know, how do we commercialize these opportunities and, and make advances. And, um, I'll, you know, that's a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, and we'll be working on that in the next couple of years. Okay, I think we're set, Rick. So thanks very much for your time today. Appreciate it. Take care. Steve. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Bye. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.